Mao's approach is as simple as it is effective. War has its meaning in enmity. Because it is the continuation of politics, it also encompasses politics, at least the possibility that there is always an element of enmity. And if peace contains the possibility of war, which from my experience unfortunately is the case, it also contains a factor of potential enmity. The question is only whether enmity can be bracketed and regulated, i.e. whether it is relative or absolute. That can be decided only by the belligerents at their own risk. For Mao, who thinks as a partisan, peace today is only manifestation of real enmity. Enmity also does not cease in so-called Cold War, which is not half war and half peace, but rather a situation of enmity with other than open violent means. Besides, only weaklings and illusionists are able to be deceived. Practically speaking, there is thus the question of what is the quantitative relation between the actions of a regular army during hostilities and other methods of the class struggle that are not overtly military. Here, Mao found a clear formula. Revolutionary war is 1 over 10 overt, regular war, and 9 out of 10 not. Based on it, a German general, Helmut Steak, formulated a definition. A partisan is a fighter who pursues war for the 9 out of 10 and leaves 1 out of 10 to the regular troops. Mao certainly did not overlook the fact that this 1 tenth is decisive for the end of the war. Yet as Europeans of the old tradition, one certainly must emphasize that when one speaks of war and peace, one is referring to the conventional classical concepts of war and peace of European bracketed war in the 19th century. Thus, not to an absolute, but only to a relative and bracketed enmity. The regular Red Army appears then only when the situation is mature enough for a communist regime. Only then does the land become openly occupied militarily. Of course, this does not have reference to a peace treaty in the sense of a classical international law. The practical significance of such a doctrine was demonstrated most vividly after 1945 with the division of Germany. On May 8, 1945, the military war against defeated Germany ended. Germany then had surrendered unconditionally. Until today, 1963, there is still no formally concluded peace between Germany and the Allied victors. Until today, the borders between East and West are precisely those lines that American and Soviet regular troops drew as their zones of occupation 18 years ago. Both the relation, with the 9 to 1 ratio, of Cold War and open hostilities as well as the deeper world political symptomatic significance of the division of Germany after 1945 are for us only examples to clarify Mao's political theory. Its core lies in the partisan, whose essential characteristic today is true enmity. Lenin's Bolshevik theory recognized and acknowledged partisans, yet by comparison with the concrete telluric reality of the Chinese partisans, there was something abstractly intellectual in Lenin's determination of the enemy. The ideological conflict between Moscow and Peking, which has become increasingly stronger since 1962, has its deepest roots in this concrete and dissimilar reality of the true partisan. Also here, the theory of the partisan proves to be the key to knowledge of political reality. From Mao Zedong to Raoul Salon. French professional officers returning from Asia to Europe have spread Mao Zedong's fame as the most modern teacher of the conduct of war. In Indochina, old-style colonial war merged with contemporary revolutionary war. There, French professional officers experienced the effectiveness of well-thought-out methods of subversive warfare and psychological mass terror, and learned that they could be combined with partisan warfare as if they were one. From their experiences, they developed the doctrine of psychological, subversive, and insurrectional warfare, about which there is already voluminous literature. Therein, one can recognize the typical product of a manner of thinking characteristic of professional officers, specifically of colonels. No more need be said here about this association with colonels, although it might be interesting to pose the question of whether, on the whole, a figure like Clausewitz 
is closer to the intellectual type of a kernel than of a general. For us, this question deals with the theory of the partisan and its consistent development. In recent years, a clear and concrete case can be embodied in a general rather than in a colonel, namely in the fate of General Raoul Salon. More than other generals such as Edmund Johad, Maurice Chalet, or Andre Zeller, he is for us the most important figure in this connection. An existential conflict is revealed in the unfolding position of this general, which is the decisive conflict for an understanding of the partisan problem, i.e., when regular troops are fighting against a fundamentally revolutionary and irregular foe, not only occasionally, but continuously in a war aimed directly at them. Salon became acquainted with the Colonel War in French Indochina as a young officer. During World War II, he was made a member of the colonial general staff and served in this capacity in French West Africa. In 1948, he became the commandant of French troops in Indochina. In 1951, he was named High Commissioner of the French Republic in North Vietnam. In 1954, he led the inquiry into the defeat at Dien Bien Phu. In November 58, he was named Supreme Commandant of French Armed Forces in Algeria. Until then, he could be described politically as on the left, and yet, in January 1957, a secret organization that might be characterized as a quote-unquote kangaroo court made an attempt on his life. But the lessons of war in Indochina and the experiences of the Algerian partisan war were such that he had absorbed the inexorable logic of partisan warfare. The premier of the former Paris government, Pierre Flimlin, gave him full powers, but on May 15, 1958, at the decisive moment, he helped General Charles de Gaulle gain power by shouting, quote unquote, Viva de Gaulle, at a public meeting in the Forum in Algiers. Yet he soon became bitterly disappointed in his expectations that General de Gaulle would defend unconditionally France's territorial sovereignty over Algeria, which was guaranteed in the Constitution. Open enmity against General de Gaulle began in 1960. In January 1961, a few of Salon's friends founded a secret army organization, the OAS, Organisation des Armées Secrètes. Salon became its leader when, on April 23rd, he was called to join the officer's putsch in Algeria. When this putsch began to crumble on April 25th, the OAS pursued systematic terrorist actions. Systematic in the sense of so-called psychological warfare of modern mosque terror, against both the Algerian enemy and the Algerian civilian population, as well as against the civilian population in France. The decisive blow against these terrorist actions occurred in April 1962, when Salon was arrested by the French police. The trial before the highest military court in Paris began on May 15th and ended on May 23, 1962. The indictment specified an attempted forceful overthrow of the legal regime and the terrorist acts of the OAS between April 1961 and April 1962. Since the court allowed for extenuating circumstances, Salon did not get the death penalty, but life in prison. Detention criminelle a perpetui. I have reminded the reader of a few important dates, but there is still no history of Salon in the OAS, and it is not my intention to meddle in the deep internal conflict of the French nation by expressing opinions and making judgments. Here, we can elaborate only a few aspects from the material that has been published in order to illuminate our substantive question. Many parallels with respect to the partisan come to mind. We will return to one of them on purely heuristic grounds and with all due caution. The analogy between the Spanish guerrilla experienced by the Prussian General Staff, 1808-1813, and the partisan warfare in Indochina and Algeria experienced by the French General Staff, 1950-60, through 60, is striking. But so are the great differences which require no further comment. There is a relationship in the core situations and in many individual fates, yet this should not be exaggerated abstractly as if these situations and fates can be identified with the theories and constructions of all the defeated armies of world history. That would be ridiculous. The case of Prussian General Ludendorff 
also is in many respects different from that of the left Republican salon. We are concerned only with a clarification of the theory of the partisan. During the trial before the high military court, Salon remained silent. At the beginning of the trial, he provided a long explanation which began with the statement, Je suis le chef de l'OAS. My responsibility est donc entière. I am head of the OAS. Therefore, the responsibility is entirely mine. In his explanation, Salon refused to call the witnesses he had named, among them President de Gaulle, and insisted that the trial be limited to the time from April 1961, the officers pushed in Algeria, to April 1962, Salon's imprisonment, whereby his essential motives were obscured and great historical events were isolated, which reduced the facts of the case to those of a normal penal code. He described the violent acts of the OAS as merely responses to the most odious atrocities that can be done to men who did not want to leave their country and did not want their country to be taken away from them. His explanation ended with the words, quote, I owe an explanation only to those who suffered and died believing a broken promise and fulfilling a betrayed duty. Henceforth, I will remain silent. End quote. Salon actually maintained his silence throughout the whole trial, even during the harsh and insistent questioning of the public prosecutor who declared that Salon's silence was just a tactic. Finally, after the public prosecutor remarked on the quote-unquote illogic of Salon's silence, the president of the high military court said that even if this behavior could not be respected, it nevertheless would be tolerated and not treated as contempt of court. When the trial was over, the president asked Salon if he had anything to say in his defense. He answered, quote, I will open my mouth only to say vive la France, and to the prosecuting attorney I say simply, que Dieu me garde, may God protect me. The first part of Salon's concluding remark was directed to the president of the high military court and had in view of presumed death sentence. In this situation, at the moment of his execution, he would shout, Viva la France! The second part was directed to the prosecuting attorney and sounded somewhat cryptic. However, it is perfectly understandable that the public prosecutor suddenly became religious, although it was certainly unusual in an all but secular state. Not only did he characterized Salon's silence as arrogant and lacking in remorse, and as an attempt to plead extenuating circumstances for a milder sentence, suddenly he spoke as he expressly stated as a, quote, Christian to a Christian, unquote, un chrétien qui s'adresse à un chrétien, and told the defendant that he had forfeited the grace of God and incurred eternal damnation, to which Salon answered, que Dieu me garde. One sees the abyss over which the sagacity and rhetoric of a political trial was played out. Yet for us, it is not the problem of political justice that is interesting, but rather the illumination of a complex of questions that have been thrown into utter confusion by such slogans as total war, psychological war, subversive war, insurrectional war, and covert war, and have occluded the problem of the modern partisan. The war in Indochina, 1946 through 54, was the, quote, ideal example of a fully developed modern revolutionary war, unquote. Salon had become acquainted with modern partisan warfare in the forests, jungles, and rice fields of Indochina. He had learned firsthand that Indochinese rice peasants could put a battalion of first-rate French soldiers on the run. He saw the squalor of refugees and became acquainted with Ho Chi Minh's underground organization, which the legal French administration overlooked and overplayed. With the exactitude and precision of a member of the general staff, he observed and scrutinized the new, more or less terrorist conduct of war. At the same time, it occurred to him that what he and his comrades called quote-unquote psychological warfare was, together with military technical action, part of modern warfare. Here, Salon readily could adopt Mao Zedong's system of thought, yet it is well known that he also had studied the literature concerning the Spanish guerrilla war against Napoleon. In Algeria, Salon faced a situation where 400,000 well-armed French soldiers fought against 20,000 Algerian partisans, with the result that France renounced its sovereignty over Algeria. The Algerian population's loss of human life was 10 to 20 times greater than on the French side, but the material expenses of the French were 10 to 20 times higher than those of the Algerians. In short, 
With his whole existence as a Frenchman and a soldier, Salon was faced with an entrange paradox, strange paradox, and an Aaron's logic, insane logic, which could embitter a brave and intelligent man and drive him to attempt a counteroffensive. Aspects and Concepts of the Last Stage In the labyrinth of such a typical situation for modern partisan warfare, we would like to distinguish four different aspects in order to gain a few clear concepts. The spatial aspect, destruction of social structures, the interlocking global political context, and finally, the technical industrial aspect. This sequence is relatively fluid. In concrete reality, these four aspects would obviously cannot be isolated as independent spheres. On the contrary, only their intensive reciprocal actions, their mutually functional dependencies, can provide the total picture. Discussion of one always contains references to and implications for the other three aspects and ultimately all flow into the force field of technical industrial development. The Spatial Aspect Completely independent of the good or ill will of men, of peaceful or hostile purposes and goals, any enhancement of human technology produces new horizons and unforeseeable changes in traditional spatial structures. That is true not only for the external and conspicuous expansions of cosmic spatial exploration, but also for our old terrestrial living spaces, workspaces, cultural spaces, and even personal spaces. Today, in the age of electric lights, long-range fuel supplies, telephones, radios, and television, the expression, quote, the home is inviolable, unquote, produces a completely different type of bracketing from what existed in the age of King John and the Magna Carta of 1215, when the lord of the manor could raise the drawbridge. The technical enhancement of human effectivity shatters whole normative systems and, as did the law of the sea in the 19th century. From the bottom of the sea, which has no lord, arose the space that lay before the coast, the so-called continental shelf, as a new sphere of human action. Bunkers for atomic waste were created in the deep of the Atlantic Ocean, which has no lord. Together with spatial structures, technical industrial progress also changes spatial orders. Law is the unity of order and orientation, and the problem of the partisan is the problem of relations between regular and irregular struggle. A modern soldier is personally either optimistic or pessimistic about the future. For our problem, that is not so important. In terms of weapons technology, every member of the general staff thinks practically and purposefully. Consequently, the spatial aspect of war is of theoretical concern to him. The structural variety of so-called theaters of war on land and on sea is an old theme. Since World War I, airspace has become a new dimension whereby the spatial structure of traditional theaters of land and sea were changed. In partisan warfare, a new, complicated, and structured sphere of action is created because the partisan does not fight on an open battlefield and does not fight on the same level of open fronts. He forces his enemy into another space. In other words, he displaces the space of regular, conventional theaters of war to a different, darker dimension, a dimension of the abyss, in which the proudly worn uniform of the conventional soldier becomes a deadly target. In this way, the partisan on land has an unexpected but no less effective analogy to a submarine at sea, which opened up an unexpected deep dimension beneath the surface on which sea war in the old style was fought. From an underground lair, the partisan disturbs the conventional, regular play of forces on the open stage. From his irregularity, he changes the dimensions of regular armies, not only tactically, but strategically as well. By exploiting their knowledge of the terrain, relatively small partisan groups can tie down great masses of regular troops. We have reference to the quote-unquote paradox with the example of Algeria. Clausewitz clearly recognized this and profoundly endorsed it in that he said that a few partisans who dominate a given terrain can claim the right to be called an army. It serves the concrete clarity of the concept that we hold to the telluric terrestrial character of the partisan and do not characterize or even define him as a corsair on land. The irregularity of the pirate lacks any relation to regularity. By contrast, 
The Corsair takes booty at sea and is equipped with a quote-unquote letter from a state government. His type of irregularity thus has some relation to regularity, which is why until the Paris Peace of 1856, he was juridically a recognized figure of European international law. To this extent, both the Corsair of sea war and the partisan of land war could be compared with each other. A strong similarity and even equality exists above all in the fact that the statement, quote, with a partisan one fights like a partisan, end quote, and the statement, a Corsair, Corsair et demi, with a Corsair one fights like a Corsair and a half, are saying essentially the same thing. However, the contemporary partisan is something different from a Corsair of land war. The elemental antithesis of land and sea remains too great. It could be that the traditional varieties of war, enmity, and booty, which until now have been the basis of the antithesis of land and sea and international law, one day will simply be dissolved in the crucible of industrial technical progress. Until now, the partisan always has been a part of the true earth. He is the last sentinel of the earth and, as yet, not completely destroyed element of world history. The Spanish guerrilla war against Napoleon came to full light only in the great spatial aspect of this antithesis of land and sea. England supported the Spanish partisans. A maritime power utilized the irregular fighters of land war for its great belligerent undertakings in order to vanquish its continental em enemy. Ultimately, Napoleon was defeated not by England, but by the land powers Spain, Russia, Prussia, and Austria. This irregular, typically telluric type of partisan fighting entered into the service of a typically maritime world politics, which relentlessly disqualified and criminalized any irregularity on the sea and in sea war law. Different types of irregularity are concretized in the antithesis of land and sea. When we keep in mind the concrete particularity of the spatial aspect characteristic of land and sea and the specific forms of their conceptual construction, the analogies are permitted and fruitful. That is especially true for the analogy introduced here for an understanding of the spatial aspect, namely that of how the sea power England, in its war against the land power France, utilized the Tyre Spanish partisans who changed the theater of land war through an irregular space and later, in World War I, how the land power Germany utilized the submarine as a weapon against the sea power England, thereby opening an unexpected space unknown to the former space of sea war. The former lords of the surface of the sea immediately sought to have the new type of war declared to be irregular, criminal, and even a type of warfare typical of pirates. Today, in the age of submarines with Polaris missiles, both Napoleon's denunciation of the Spanish guerrillas and England's denunciation of German submarines appear to be on one and the same intellectual plane, namely, denunciation of worthless judgments with respect to incalculable spatial changes. Destruction of Social Structures The French in Indochina, 1946-56, through 56, experienced a powerful example of destruction of social structures when their colonial empire collapsed. We have referred to Ho Chi Minh's organization of partisan warfare in Vietnam and Laos, where the communists also utilized the unpolitical civilian population in their struggle. They even corralled the domestic employees of French officers and officials as well as French army maintenance personnel. They extorted taxes from the civilian population and perpetrated all types of terrorist acts in order to cause the French to initiate acts of counter-terror against the indigenous population, which incited even more hatred against the French. In short, the modern form of revolutionary war led to many new sub-conventional means and methods, but a detailed discussion of these is beyond the scope of our discussion. A commonwealth exists as Republica, as a public sphere, and is challenged if a non-public space develops within it, which actually repudiates the public sphere. Perhaps this explanation is sufficient to demonstrate that the partisan who displays the technical military consciousness of the 19th century suddenly reappeared as the focus of a new type of war whose meaning and goal was destruction and the existing social order. This becomes obvious in the changed practice of hostage taking. In the Franco-German War, German troops took dignitaries of an area as hostages for protection against the franc tireurs mayors, pastors, doctors, and notaries. 
Respect for such dignitaries and notables could be used to pressure the whole population because social respect for such, typically bourgeois, classes was very strong. Precisely, these bourgeois classes became the real enemy in the revolutionary civil war of communism. Given the situation, whoever used such dignitaries as hostages worked for the communist side. The communists were able to use this type of hostage taking so purposefully that, if necessary, they could initiate it either to destroy a particular bourgeois class or to force it to the communist side. In Schroer's book on the partisan, this new reality is well recognized. As it reports, in partisan warfare, a truly effective hostage taking is possible only against the partisans themselves or against their closest operatives. Otherwise, one only creates new partisans. Conversely, to the partisan, every soldier of the regular army, every man in uniform, is a hostage. As Schroer's writes, quote, every uniform should feel threatened and thereby everything that it stands for, end quote. One need only to think this logic of terror and counter-terror through to the end, and then to apply it to every type of civil war in order to see the destruction of social structures at work today. A few terrorists are able to threaten great masses. Wider spaces of insecurity, fear, and general mistrust are added to the narrower space of open terror, creating a, quote, landscape of treason, end quote. As Margaret Bovary has described in a series of four remarkable books. Most nations of the European continent have experienced this new reality both physically and personally during the course of the two world wars and post-war situations. <laughs>